you know English? Yeah, I know. Like the older people, they know English from before because it used to be Malaysia was a British colony. But you know, nowadays it's not taught so much, and the English is weak, and some people they need translation. But if you're all okay, I'll just keep speaking in English, and I'll try to speak slowly. Is it too fast for you? Are you okay? Sometimes, you know, I'm not an American, I'm British, so my English is slower. If you get Americans coming in, <laughs> Be a Goswami? 
live under a different tree every night and beg, do matukari, go to the Brishpasi people and beg some fresh roti. Not very easy thing to do. Prabhupada gave the name Goswami to some people, just like maybe you know Jagannatha Goswami. Does he come here? There's one Goswami who comes to Malaysia. His name is Jananda Goswami. Jananda Das Goswami. So, Prabhupada said, when Prabhupada gave the name Goswami, the devotees asked, what does it mean? And Prabhupada said, you study that song. You study the song, the Goswami Astika, and you can understand what it means to be a Goswami. So, but what, what did these Goswamis do? Well, they studied all the scriptures. Prabhupada said, we don't have to do any research. The research is already done for us. We're very lucky. We just have to read the books of the Goswamis. The Goswamis, they researched all the scriptures and many scriptures, many books, and they gave us the important points in their writings. So Srila Rupa Goswami, he wrote many books, but two of them were taken by Srila Prabhupada and translated for us. First of all, Prabhupada translated the book called Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and that is there in the English form as the nectar of devotion. So Prabhupada wrote that book very early in the beginning of our Krishna consciousness movement. When Prabhupada went to America, he wanted to Translate, he translated and wrote his, the summary of this book and one of the American devotees, a devotee called Jayananda Prabhu, he donated the money for the printing cost. Actually Jayananda was a young American man and he drove a taxi. He was not a very rich man, but he drove a taxi in San Francisco. And he gave the money he earned to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada used it to print that book, The Nectar of Devotion, that's mentioned in the introduction. So when Prabhupada had taken initiation, Prabhupada's spiritual master, who knows the name? Prabhupada's spiritual master? What was his name? No, ladies? Ladies, what's the name of Prabhupada's spiritual master? Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati. Yes. Bhakti Siddhanta When Prabhupada took initiation, that was in what year Prabhupada got initiation? When did Prabhupada get initiation? 1933. He met his spiritual master first in 1922. What year is it this year? 2022. What is this year? 2000 and? 2022, right? In a few days it will be 23. But just now it's 22. It is exact. It was 100 years ago, Prabhupada met his spiritual master first and they met at a place called Uta Danga which is in Kalpata and you can go there and just recently we bought that house the Iskon managed to purchase the house where Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati first met Bhakti Vedanta Swami and where he told him you are a nice young man. Why don't you preach the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? 
just during the pandemic, I was staying in India, I was in Mayapur, and one, one point I had the opportunity to go to a place where they were keeping the original Chaitanya Bhagavat. The Chaitanya Bhagavat is a book written by a devotee called Vrindavan Das Thakur. So Vrindavan Das Thakur, he was a disciple of Lord Nityananda, direct disciple. Actually, he said he was the last disciple of Lord Nityananda. And he wrote the Chaitanya Bhagavat on palm leaves. And they have the palm leaves. They have the palm leaves in this one place, not very far away from Sridham Mayapur. So we went there and we were able to see the original Chaitanya Bhagavat on palm leaves in a glass box to protect it. Similarly, you go to Vrindavan. In Vrindavan, there is the Vrindavan Research Institute and they have a library and they have some of the original writings of Rupa and Jiva Goswami who were very prominent in the Goswamis. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur found this book, the Upadeshnam Rita, and he knew, oh, this is the book by Rupa Goswami. Oh, he was very happy. Look, this will bring great delight to all the devotees of the Lord. They will be so much benefited by reading this book. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he got the book and of course he copied it, he had to copy it and, make, and then he also wrote some commentary, he added some co comments onto the verses and then later on Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada also wrote commentaries on it and then in 1971-72, Srila Prabhupada began, he translated the book and he also wrote his commentary, his purpose on the book. It's not a very big book, right? How many verses are in, how many chapters are in the Bhagavad Gita? copies. We won't print many copies. 
But when Prabhupada heard, he said, why? He said, why you do that? He said, no, that this book is for general public. This book is for mass distribution. A very important book. And so it was printed thousands of copies. Very wonderful book. Everybody can read about Bhakti Yoga from the beginning to the topmost level. To go and live in Radhakund on the bank of the Radhakund. So uh, this, is, this is there in the nectar of instruction. Upadesh Amrita, the nectar of instruction. In just 11 verses. And Srila Prabhupada explains the book in a very wonderful way. You go through the book, the nectar of instruction, there are so many verses quoted in the purport that if you know all the verses which are quoted in that book, you have a very good knowledge of Krishna consciousness. Everything is explained there within the, the 11 verses. So it's such a wonderful, powerful book that we need to hear it and we need to study it again and again. And the more you read it and you study it, the more you get purified, the more you will benefit. So Srila Prabhupada has written there in the introduction about how the book begins by explaining the importance of controlling the mind and senses. And Srila Prabhupada explains that in every spiritual practice, in every process of self-realization, one has to control the mind and the senses. So the nectar of instruction begins from that position, explaining the importance of controlling the mind and the senses. Controlling the mind, of course, it's easier to control the senses, harder to control the mind. But even controlling the senses is not very easy, we know. And what is the most difficult of all the senses to control? Which sense? We have, we have five senses. Which one is the most difficult to control? Tongue. The tongue, yes. Right? When we say, when we take prasada, we always say the prayer, Sharira of the Chajam. Don't get excited. We're not going to have prasada yet. <laughs> but that verse, that prayer is describing that of all the senses, the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. Very difficult to control. But Lord Krishna is so kind, He has given us this nice prasada. So we chant Lord Krishna's name and we take prasada. And in this way, we can use our tongue in the service of Krishna. So Krishna consciousness does not deny the senses. But we want to purify the senses. We don't want to stop the senses. We don't say don't eat. And we don't say don't speak. You go other places, they'll tell you don't speak. They'll say do mona brat. And they'll say don't eat, just fast. We don't say that. We say eat. But eat, prasada. And we say speak. Chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Chanting the holy name and speaking the glories of Lord Krishna. Very important and very powerful for us. If we will chant and the holy name and speak about Krishna, then certainly our 
ears will benefit a lot. So we need to use the tongue. We need to check. So controlling the senses means use the senses in the service of Krishna. Don't try to stop the senses, but we want to purify the senses. So we use the tongue to chant, and with our eyes, we want to see Krishna. We see the deities. We see Krishna. Are you seeing Krishna? Or is Krishna seeing you? Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati said, actually, we go to the temple to be seen. Not to see, but to be seen. The deity is looking at us. He's seeing us. We may not be seeing the deity, but the deity is seeing us. One man was a blind man, and he asked his friend, Take me to the temple. So his friend was surprised. Why you want to go to the temple? You cannot see anything. He said, I cannot see, but I want Krishna to see me. So that's important. That, that's what we come to the temple for. To be seen by Krishna. Of course, we also use our eyes we have to read Prabhupada's books. We read the books. That's very important for us. So Rupa Goswami, he wrote this book, Upadesham. He wrote other books just like Nectar of Devotion. He also wrote that. So the, the Nectar of Devotion, that's a big book. But the Nectar of Instruction, smaller book. It's put in a short form. But it's the same kind of teaching. The message which is there in the nectar of devotion is all there in the Upadesha Amrita, in the nectar of instruction. So you read that nectar of instruction and you will understand what is the Goswami. First of all, the first verse describes the Goswami. How? You have to control the mind and senses. Vacho vikam manasa kroda vikam. One who can tolerate the mind's demand. Manasa. And kroda vega. Vega means the urge. You know, we sometimes kroda vega, the urge to become angry. Right? Do you ever get angry? Only sometimes. Yeah? Yes, we have this problem. It's quite common. We get angry. We have to control that anger. People say, well, anger, I can use it in Krishna's service. Yes, if you are a pure devotee, you can use it in Krishna. Just like Hanuman could get angry, he could go to Lanka and fight with Ravan. He used his anger in the service of Lord Ramachandra. And also Arjuna, he fought at Kurukshetra to win the battle of Kurukshetra and to please Lord Krishna. So anger can be used in the service of Krishna, but you have to be very careful because anger can also degrade. Anger can also give us problems. We become controlled by the anger. We don't control. So Upanishamrita said, Kroda Begam. You have to control the urge to become angry. We have to control that very carefully. Because in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains three gates to hell. Lust, anger,
anger and greed. So every sane person will do well to avoid these three things. It, it is pointed out that anger comes from lust. Lust. It described in the Bhagavad Gita the all-devouring sinful enemy. And it burns like fire and it is never satisfied. And from lust comes anger. When we don't get what we want, we become angry. And when we do get what we want, we become greedy for more. So everything is coming from lust. We have to be very careful to avoid this enemy. The enemy, the lust. So Rupa Goswami begins the nectar of instruction by talking about controlling the mind and senses. Vacho Vegam Manasta Kroda Vegam. Vacho Vegam Manasta Kroda Vegam. One who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, and the reactions of anger. Then Udara Pasta Vega, Itan Vega, Yo Vishahe Tadira, Sarvam Abhimam Prithivin Shashishya. He said, when we can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands and the actions of anger, and the urge of the tongue, and the belly, and the genitals, then one can except disciples around the world. Then you can become the teacher. Actually, Lord Chaitanya has ordered everyone to become a teacher and to teach about Krishna. Lord Chaitanya told everyone, become a spiritual teacher, become a guru, and tell people about Krishna. But we have to be a good teacher. If we don't show the right example, then we won't be a good teacher. So Rupa Goswami, Rupa Goswami, he was a good teacher. He was a Goswami. There are, Go means the senses and Swami means the controller. So Rupa Goswami was very controlled. He lived in Vrindavan, as I said, sleeping under a different tree every night and then begging just whatever food he could get from the simple farmers in Vrindavan. He was living in the jungle. There were wild animals. But he was not afraid because he was sure of the protection of Lord Krishna. So Rupa Goswami was very detached from the, although as a young man he had been very rich he had given it all up to take up Krishna conscious lifestyle he had left everything Rupa Goswami used to live with Sanatan Goswami and they lived in a place called Ramakeli Ramakeli is a very amazing place very wonderful it's in Bengal. It's not very far away from Mayapur. And if you can go there, you will appreciate how wonderful the place is. There are so many cows there. Cows are wandering around, you know. It's just like, a, like going back in time, 500 years. There's so many cows and the place is just like the garden. So Rupa and Sanatan, they used to live there in this Ramakiri. When I went there, the devotees told me that many tourists come there to Ramakiri. But they don't come because of Rupa and Sanatan. They come because of another person. They come because of the Nawab. You know the Nawab? Nawab Hussein Shah. 
He, he lived there. His palace was there. And they come to see the ruins of the palace of the Nawab. So Rupa and Sanatan, they were in the service of the Nawab Putin Shah. They had actually become Mohammedans. But they got the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. And with Lord Chaitanya's encouragement, they gave up everything and they left Ramakali and they went to Vrindavan. And they wrote books. They were very learned scholars. They knew many languages. And they wrote these books. They studied the scriptures and they wrote this, these books like Upadesh Amrita, the Nectar of Instruction. So Rupa Goswami actually he, he had been taught by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya met them first at Ramakali and then both Rupa and Sanatan they decided to leave. They gave up their big positions. One was the Prime Minister and the other was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So they were very big people in the government of the Nawab, but they left everything. They gave it all up and they went to Vrindavan. Before they went to Vrindavan, first of all, Rupa met Lord Chaitanya at uh, an Am 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 Prayagraj. No, what's the Amahaba? I always get mixed up these two words. Anyway, Prayagraj. Now it's called Prayagraj. So that place where the Ganga and the Yamuna meet. Prayagraj. He was there at the Dash Ashwamedha Ghat. And Lord Chaitanya instructed Rupa Goswami for 10 days in Krishna consciousness. And then he told him, now go to Vrindavan and go and discover all the places of Krishna's pastimes. Because at that time, there were no temples in Vrindavan. Practically, there was nothing there. Nobody knew where all the holy places were. It was the Goswamis who went there and they discovered the places. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally came there to Vrindavan. And he asked them, where is Radha Kund? And they said, we don't know. Radha Kund? Where? We never heard of it. Nobody had heard of it. So then, Lord Chaitanya went and he found that there, there was a place where Aristasur had been killed. Aristasur was one demon in the form of a bull, was killed by Lord Krishna. And there, that was where the Radha Kun and the Shama Kun came. Because after Krishna killed Aristasura, then Srimati Radharani said to Lord Krishna, now you're contaminated. You have to purify yourself. You will have to go to all the holy places around the planet and take back in all the holy rivers. And only then you can be freed of your sin because you killed the bull. So Lord Krishna said, well, I don't need to go there. I'll call them all to come here. Because it's Krishna. He's the Supreme. So he called all the dead on all the holy rivers. They all came. And they all poured water on Lord Krishna. And they created the Shama Kund. And then Krishna said to Srimati Radharani, now you have to purify yourself because you've been associating with me. So you have to purify yourself. So Radharani began to make Radhakund. And they brought the water from Manasaganga, but it was taking a long time. So Lord Krishna told them, I will help you. And then they arranged that all the water came and filled up Radhakund and Shamakund. That was 5,000 years ago, and then 500 years ago, Lord Chaitanya came there to Radha Kund, and it was very changed. 
There was nothing that Radakon had become a rice field. And Lord Chaitanya said, this is the place. Because Lord Chaitanya is Krishna. Shri Krishna Chaitanya. Radha Krishna. Nahi Anya. Right? You got it? Shri Krishna Chaitanya. Radha Krishna. Nahi Anya. That Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the combined form of Radha and Krishna. They come together. Radha and Krishna were one, but they separated themselves. But then they became again one in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu is a combined form. He is Krishna, but in the mood of Srimati Radharani. Then who is Rupa Goswami? We should understand who is Rupa Goswami. Because he's telling us everything about Lord Krishna and Radha. How does he know? How does Rupa Goswami know everything? Because Rupa Goswami in Krishna Leela, he is Rupa Manjari. He is a Manjari. You know, there's the gopis. The gopis are the older women. Right? But the Manjaris, they're the young girls. The Manjaris are just young girls. They haven't reached puberty yet. So they're just young girls. So the Manjaris, they're engaged in intimate service for Radha and Krishna. Because they're just young girls. They don't know anything. If they were grown up, then they would be envious. Oh, this man, and why this woman's always with this man? And that the other woman comes and she'll be envious, you know? So usually couples, married couples, they need their own house, you know, they need their own place. Difficult for them to stay together. The man and woman, you know, the, the couple, they have to have their, their place. If you put them with other couples, then they'll be quarreling. Difficulties. So, Manjaris, however, they are young girls. And the young girls, they're not, they don't have, they don't know anything, they don't have any feeling or anything for young men, but they can be there and they can do service for Radha and Krishna. So, this is the, the, the gopis, they're too, they're too old. They're already gopis. Teenage girls, you know, so they're already, you know, women. So you can't bring them into so much into Radha and Krishna because they'll get jealous. They may feel some, you know, attraction. So the Manjaris, they're the ones who do actual service for Radha and Krishna. So Rupa Goswami, he is Rupa. Manjari in the spiritual world. In Krishna Lila, he is known as Rupa Manjari. And he is the leader of the Manjaris who are all serving Radha and Krishna, making arrangements for the customs of Radha and Krishna. And all of the Acharyas in the line of the disciplic succession, they're all identified as being manjaris, that there are different manjaris who assist in the loving affairs of Radha and Krishna. So this is uh, the wonder of uh, the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, the one coming from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Rupa Goswami is Rupa Manjari, so he knows all about the loving affairs of Radha and Krishna. In his spiritual body, he's personally there with Radha and Krishna. And he came in the material body to be in the pastime of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and to be a disciple of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And as a disciple of Mahaprabhu, 
Lord, he was chanting the holy name. He was chanting many rounds and he was doing paridrama and he was discovering all the holy places of Krishna's pastimes and he was writing books about Krishna's pastimes. And he wrote books like this Upadesh Amrita, which we want all of you to have a copy. You should have your own copy. You can have a soft copy if you like. You know, you can, but you have to read this book. It's very, very, very important. And it's not a big book. Only 11 mantras. You can read the book. But you have to read it carefully. You want to understand it very carefully. And get familiar with everything which is mentioned there. Just like the book begins with controlling the mind and senses. So then Rupa Goswami then goes on in the second sloka, he describes what you need to do to help you to control the mind and senses. And he describes things which are favorable for devotional service, which will help you to advance in devotional service. And he mentioned six items. Six, there are six things which you're supposed to do which will help you to progress. First of all, enthusiasm. Utsahan. Enthusiasm. Very important. Just like you have to have a lot of enthusiasm to wake up in the morning, to go to Mangalarti, to change your rounds, right? You have to have some enthusiasm. Go for Shankirtan, go out for book distribution. You have some enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is very important. And you should also be patient. You can't expect that immediately you're going to become a pure devotee. It's going to take some time. Sometimes you think, oh, I've only got two arms. Why I haven't got four arms? I've already been chanting Hare Krishna for four years now. I should have four arms by now. But no. Next slide, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Next slide, maybe. So, take patience is important. And determination. You have to be very determined that I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a devotee my whole life. Right? Your whole life. You want to give to Krishna Consciousness. I'm going to chant every day. I'm going to serve Krishna. Just like we have the deity here. So deity, maybe you have deity in your home. Right? How many of you have got deity in your home? How many? Some people. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So when you have the deity, Right? You have to be determined. When I cook, I will offer the food to the deity. Whatever you cook, you offer to the deity. And in that way, you always have to sign up. So you have to be determined. Sometimes you may think, oh, I cook, ah, oh, I'm not going to offer to the deity. So the deity already has enough to eat. I'll just I'm just taking the lead myself. No, we have to be determined. We have to fight against the mind. So this the enthusiasm, patience, determination. Prabhupada said in everything, these three things are very important. And especially in cultivating devotional service. They're very, very important for us. We have Prabhupada liked our 
enthusiasm. We didn't know anything. We didn't understand anything. But whatever Prabhupada told us to do, yes, Prabhupada, you know, we'll go and do it. You know, Prabhupada said, go to China. Yes, Prabhupada, you go. Go to go to Africa. And Prabhupada sent the devotees all over the world. And they would go and preach. And Prabhupada expected us to do it. So enthusiasm, very important. Just like the devotees came to Malaysia. There were no devotees here, but the devotees came and Prabhupada came. Prabhupada came in 1971. Follow the, 
the Acharyas, like we said, Rupa Goswami, so many other great Acharya, Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Vinod, we should follow their principles, their teachings. And that if we do these things, then we can progress very nicely. And there are things we should give up, things which we shouldn't do. Rupa Goswami lists six, six items, things we should not do. He said, overeating, not good. Right? You cannot be a yogi if you eat too much or eat too little. So you have to eat, but don't overeat. Srila Prabhupada told us, he used to tell us anyway, when I was a devotee, young devotee, don't eat grains after four o'clock in the afternoon. Means don't eat rice at night. Right? I know that's a difficult thing for all of you. There's a balance. 
You have to know what is necessary and what is not. So Prabhupada was an expert, he could understand rules and regulations, just like things like uh, women. So Prabhupada accepted ladies as his disciples and he gave them initiation. And they even had a Brahmacharini ashram. The late ladies, before their marriage, they lived in the Brahmacharini ashram. And in this way they get trained to become a good wife. After they lived in the Brahmacharini ashram, then they're happy to get married and live with the husband. They never want to live in the Brahmacharini ashram again. So that Prabhupada introduced Brahmacharini Ashram. Prabhupada also allowed ladies to offer arti, do things like offering arti. And, and uh, Prabhupada also did things like having his Guru Puja. And then, uh, oh, he adjusted the number of rounds. Bhakti Siddhanta Tarasati has said everybody should change 64 rounds and Prabhupada reduced it to 16. So Prabhupada made some adjustments. He made it easier. He changed, changed some details. He didn't say every day you have to eat dosa and idli. He said you can have spaghetti, you can have pasta, and you have enough potatoes, you know, whatever the people eat in the Western country. Not everybody can eat rice and dal and chapatis, but you can eat also Western style pizza and whatever they eat there, you know. So Prabhupada adjusting details, but must be vegetarian, must be prasad. So like that. So don't be too attached to the rules and regulations. But at the same time, don't be neglectful. Keep the principle. Don't be too independent. So like this, Rupa Goswami describes these different things. And he goes on and on. And then he, after explaining about devotional service in the beginning, then he talks about Baba Bhakti, about spontaneous devotion. And then he tells about, you want to do Baba Bhakti? Raganuga Bhakti, go to Vrindavan. And then where should you go in Vrindavan? Don't just go and go to Radha Kund. Rupa Goswami said, yes, you have to leave the home. Go to Vrindavan. And where in Vrindavan? To Radha Kund. And go and sit there at Radha Kund and chant the holy name constantly. Like this, Rupa Goswami is describing devotional service, bringing it to the highest level, which is far beyond anything we are capable of at this time. But one day, we hope, one day, gradually we can go there and sit down in Radhakund and chant the Holy Name and read the books of the Goswamis. But you can read the books of the Goswamis while you are here. You don't need to go to Radha Kund to chant the holy name. But you can prepare yourself for going there. You chant the holy name here and read the books of the Goswamis and then one day you want to go to Radha Kund and sit there and chant the holy name and read the books of the Goswamis. Alright, we will stop here tonight. Are there any questions? What 
is their attitude? Are they chanting the holy name without offense? What is their mood in chanting the holy name? Are they chanting the holy name to become one with Krishna? Are they thinking they're going to enter into Krishna Leela and dance with the gopis? You have to consider what is their attitude? Prabhupada writes about that in the introduction to the Upanishad Vedanta. Everything depends on the attitude. What is your attitude? What is your mood in performing devotional service? So it's not just doing it, but what is your attitude? Why are you doing it? What do you, what do you want to get from it? Do you just want to please Krishna? Or you, have you got some desire? I want something. You want to be a great devotee. You want to be recognized. You want to be a big acharya. What do you want? Everyone has some motive in their application of service. So you have to consider that Krishna knows everybody's heart. Krishna's in the heart. So he knows everyone, what they're thinking, what they want. So it depends on that. You cannot, I cannot say, oh, he's from that Sampradaya, or he's doing this, they do it. It depends on the, the, their heart, their mood. What are they trying for? What do they want? Any 
बाबाजी जगन्नाथ दास बाबा जी महाराज भक्ति विनोद ठाकुर महाराज और मंजिली महाराज और मंजिली
And by Kunta, there's no old people. Everybody is the same age in their spiritual body. If you go to Goloka, in Goloka, then you've got cowherd boys. You know, the cowherd. The nature of the spiritual world, there's no old age, there's no COVID, <laughs> and there's no death.
take shelter from what? Prabhupada is the guru. You take shelter from what?